and is probably the most intensely and completely coloured cichlid found in the lake. However, I didn't listen to my own advice. Instead, I purchased four adult lelupies. I recommend commencing target feeding of the fry around the four to five day mark after they hatch. G'day guys, Jason here. Welcome back to my fish room. So in this week's video, we're gonna be doing an in-depth species profile on Neolemprologus lelupi. And the reason we're doing this in-depth species profile is because we've reached a bit of a milestone and that is 4,000 subscribers. I really can't believe it. So to thank you guys for that, I um, finally made this video that I've been promising for well over a year and I really hope you enjoy it and find it informative. So here it is. Neolamprologus leilupi is a cichlid that is endemic to Lake Tanganyika in Africa and is probably the most intensely and completely coloured cichlid found in the lake. They are sometimes referred to as the lemon cichlid due to their sometimes vivid yellow coloration. There are many different types of leilupi found in the lake which have very different coloration with some types being different shades of brown and even jet black. There are very similar looking species of Neolamprologus that share the same cylindrical body shape as Leilupi, such as Neolamprologus cylindricus and Neolamprologus nigravensis. However, Leilupi are almost identical to the extremely similar looking Neolamprologus longior. The difference here is that Leilupi have a somewhat thicker, more solid looking body with a higher back, whereas longior look more slender and elongated. Coloration is also said to be a way of identifying the difference between the two species, However, both share yellow and orange color variants. They are also said to be closely related to Neolamprologus mustax, which shares the yellow coloration, although not as intensely, and mustax also have an even higher back than Leilupi. These species I have mentioned inhabit different locations along the shoreline of the lake and seemingly have little overlap. That said, it is possible that the species do extend beyond what has been researched and mapped. Now in my in-depth species profile on Altolamprologus calvus, I talked a little bit about the meaning of the name Altolamprologus. In that video, I stated that I didn't know what the meaning of the name Lamprologus meant, and I suspected it was broken up into two words, those being Lampro and Logus. I then said that in Latin, that Lampro meant lustrous and Logus meant lark or joke. However, I have since found out the correct meaning of the name Lamprologus. It is actually made up of two Greek words, not Latin. Those are Lampros, sometimes it is spelt as Lambros, which means bright, brilliant, shining, or torch, and Lagos, which means hair. The neo part of the name simply translates to the word new. So I am glad I cleared that up, and I hope I am correct and not adding further confusion to all this. While well, the specific name Leilupi honours the Belgian entomologist Narcisse Leilup, who lived from 1912 to 2001, he collected them in the early 1950s. They are a relatively easy cichlid to care for, provided you keep up with regular water changes of approximately 20% per week. As they are from Lake Tanganyika, it is the second deepest lake on the planet, so these guys do best with stable water parameters with an alkaline pH of at least 7.5 and hard water around 10 to 15 dGH. With a temperature of approximately 24 to 27 degrees, that's 75 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Provided you give them these conditions, Leilupi can live up to 10 years and sometimes longer. Leilupi are carnivores, and as such, their diet needs to consist of protein, which is not hard to replicate in captivity. In the wild, they eat the fry of other fish, crustaceans, and insect larvae, and are basically pretty opportunistic. In captivity, they readily accept many types of foods, including flakes, pellets, frozen, and of course, live foods. Rather than offering one food, it is best to offer them a wide range of different foods to ensure they are getting as many of the vitamins and minerals they need to stay healthy. I feed mine high quality pellets, frozen brine shrimp, frozen mysis shrimp and frozen krill, as well as live daphnia when I am culturing it. For the pellets, I like to soak them in aquarium water first to allow the pellets time to expand and soften up before feeding. This allows the pellets to swell up in my feeding container rather than in the fish's gut. It helps to ensure the fish eat only the amount they require rather than overeating and thus the pellets are potentially expanding in the fish's gut, which may push on their internal organs. In the past, I've had some fish, not necessarily Leilupi, develop swim bladder problems, and I believe, although I'm not 100% sure, that soaking the pellets before feeding helps to prevent issues such as swim bladder problems. Diet also plays a very important role in your Leilupi's colour. Without going too deep into colour enhancing foods, this is, after all, a species profile video. A colour enhancing foods video is a video for another day. However, your usual colour enhancing foods that contain spirulina will help but feeding foods which contain astaxanthin or paprika will help you further keep your Leilupi bright yellow or orange coloration. Astaxanthin is a red pigment found in different types of algae, krill and shrimp. 
It also gives fish such as salmon and trout their reddish colour. Paprika will help with orange coloration, otherwise if you see fish food containing marigold petals, this is another great colour enhancer for orange coloration. However, no amount of colour enhancing food can beat starting with a quality bloodline as this plays a huge role in how bright yellow or bright orange your Leilupi can potentially become. In regards to tank size, I would recommend 6 young Leilupi in say a 200 litre aquarium and allow them to grow up together so pairs can naturally form. However, for a mated pair, I wouldn't go smaller than a 100 litre aquarium. As Leilupi are rock dwelling cichlids, a shallow aquarium with a wide footprint is preferred to a tall, narrow aquarium. While they will still swim in the open water, they do prefer to stay near their rock piles and caves. As such, having a wide, shallow aquarium will enable you to supply them with more rock piles and caves and is much more suited for them. As they do love to dig, supply them with fine crushed coral sand to assist in buffering your water or a far cheaper option of pull filter sand like I use. Providing them with sand will allow them to feel right at home in your aquarium and you will see them pretty much re their tank. You can see here the amount of digging my breeding pair have done. Pretty amazing to see how quickly they can shift so much sand. Now if you want your Leilupi to keep their bright yellow orange coloration, then I recommend you keep them in a bright aquarium. That includes lighting and light coloured aquarium decor. While these guys are fine in an aquarium with dim or even no light, their colour best shows with a brightly lit aquarium. I have seen this with my own Leilupi as at one stage I was forced to keep Leilupi fry with some of my Alto Lamprologus calvus fry as I had nowhere else to put the Leilupi fry. On my calvus fry grow out aquariums, I did not put their tank lights on as I find calvus fry survival rates are higher without specific tank lighting. For calvus fry grow out tanks, I simply use the ambient light in the fish room for their day night cycle. Since doing this, I have been having close to 100% survival rates with my calvus fry. So because my calvus fry tanks don't have lights and I was forced to put some Leilupi fry in with them, those Leilupi didn't develop their yellow coloration like their slightly older brothers and sisters that were in their own Leilupi grow out tank which had a bright light on it. The Leilupi that were kept with the calvus and no light were a very pale yellow, while the Leilupi kept in a brighter cream were exhibiting their parents' bright yellow orange coloration from approximately being 2 centimeters in length. The other thing I recommend doing is keeping light coloured substrate and minimal dark objects in the aquarium. So white or pale coloured sand is preferred over black or dark sand. My Leilupi are in an aquarium with dark grey rocks and a black background and exhibit their bright coloration mainly due to the light coloured pool filter sand. When I had my Leilupi in their quarantine tank, the tank had a black background and black sides and was also bare bottom. Usually a bare bottom tank would have been a problem with aquariums as they usually sit on white polystyrene. However, these tanks were sitting on black neoprene. So my newly purchased Leilupi had to spend their quarantine period in an aquarium with black walls on four sides. Not ideal in the slightest and as such the Leilupi began to darken up within a few days. Moving them to an aquarium with light substrate will reverse this back and their colour should return. However, do your best to avoid this with fry as I have heard it is harder to get them to colour up later in life if they are raised up in a dark aquarium. They can be kept with other fish and I recommend their tank mates be different cichlids from Lake Tanganyika. They can be kept with other rock dwelling cichlids such as Neolamprologus or Julidochromus. As long as their tank is large enough, at least 4 foot long, this is just to avoid fighting over competing territories as all are rock dwellers. This can be minimised by having numerous rock piles at different ends of the aquarium. If you want a colourful Lake Tanganyika community aquarium, you can't go past tank mates of Cyprochromus. The fact that Cyprochromus love to swim in open water and lay loopies hug the rockwork means you won't have fish competing for the same territory in the one aquarium. The Cyprochromus will add a lot of colour, activity and movement to the tank while the Leilupi will do their thing amongst the rockwork. Just note that if you do choose to go with Cyprochromus, it is best to have a deeper tank, greater than one foot deep, preferably two foot deep, for them to enjoy swimming in the open water rather than a shallow tank. While Leilupi are not the most aggressive cichlid to other cichlids, they are aggressive to other Leilupi. And if you have more than one bonded pair in an aquarium of less than 200 litres, your other Leilupi will soon be found to be hugging the top corners of the aquarium. This will lead to those poor Leilupi being stressed and more susceptible to disease. It is at this stage that it is best to remove the bullied Leilupi from the aquarium and leave the bonded pair to themselves. Male Leilupi can grow to almost 12 centimetres, that's 5 inches in the aquarium, with females growing to just under 9 centimetres or 3.5 inches. They aren't easy to sex at a young age, however probably the easiest indicator being the size of their loopy from the same brood with a larger fry more than likely being the males in the group. Males will also be seen to be more aggressive. Mature males will also begin to show the more usual signs of cichlid males such as longer and more pointed dorsal and pelvic fins. Mature adult males of a few years old will also develop bulbous heads 
known as a cranial hump. However, mature females can develop this feature as well, be it smaller than on the males. I recommend you purchase a group of say six juveniles and grow them up together to hopefully get a pair to form naturally as they grow into adulthood. However, I didn't listen to my own advice. Instead, I purchased four adult Leilupis. When I purchased mine, they were in an aquarium with about 30 other adult Leilupi. I did my best to watch them all for a few minutes. Watching their behavior in the aquarium shop, I did my best to sex two males and two females. I was again looking for the telltale signs of males versus females in regards to size, fin shape, and length, as well as behavior to the other Leilupi. But rather than attempting to sex one male and one female and just buying two fish, I bought four to again, better my chances of at least getting a pair from these four adults. I did this because even though you have one male and one female, it doesn't mean that you will get them to form a bond and breed. And like I have said in my other species profile videos, even buying a sexed breeding pair doesn't necessarily guarantee that they will also breed for you. So because I was buying adults, I bought four and tried to sex them all to better my chances of getting at least one pair from them. The general consensus with breeding substrate spawning cichlids from Lake Tanganyika is to buy a group of at least four to six juveniles and let them grow up together. As they mature, a pair will usually form amongst the group and you should generally end up with a breeding pair from this method. This is the usual agreed method, which is a pretty surefire way of getting a breeding pair to form. However, depending on the species of cichlid and the age of these fish at the time you purchase them, it could take one to two years to get your first spawn. For some people, that is a long time but it is extremely rewarding once you do get them to spawn. I generally also would recommend that you do try this method to better guarantee your chances of ending up with a breeding pair. However, I did not always take my own advice and I could not resist buying these guys when I first saw them. Seeing the Alamprologosei lupi of this quality and color is rare and I had to jump at the opportunity, so I bought four adults. I figured I would be lucky to get a pair out of these four fish. I set myself a time frame and thought I would be extremely lucky if I could get them to spawn within the first six months. Well, from the moment I put them into their quarantine aquarium, it appeared that one of what I suspected was a female was showing interest in one of the larger Leilupi, which I believed was a male. And this is that behavior here, which I filmed the night I put them in the tank. However, over the next few days, that changed. The two fish I suspected were the females were hiding behind the sponge filters and the two larger Leilupi, which I suspected were the males, were living in the caves. After two weeks, I added some terracotta sauces to the tank that I cut with a hole saw like you see here. And within a few days of adding these, I noticed the Leilupi had spawned. This all happened within 20 days of purchasing the four adults and has been documented on my channel. See some videos from early 2021. I couldn't believe it. Not only did I manage to get a pair to form a bond within a month, but they had also spawned in that time. The female's chosen spawning site was inside one of these very terracotta saucers I had placed in the aquarium a few days earlier. When this happened, I still had the other two Leilupi in the aquarium with the bonded pair. I noticed that the excess male had forced his way inside the saucer and managed to eat some of the eggs. I quickly prepared another quarantine tank and moved the excess Leilupi into this aquarium. Because after all, these fish were still in quarantine. I usually quarantined newly purchased fish for at least six weeks. The first sign that your Leilupi are forming a bond is the female and male coming into contact with one another, literally touching their bodies together. The female and sometimes male will then shudder their bodies like you see here, almost like the fish are having a fit. I believe this is a sign of submission and that is why it is usually seen from the smaller female. But again, I have seen my male do it on occasion too. If the female or subdominant fish does not do this shudder, then they will be chased by the male or dominant fish and may also get bitten. If this continues, you will soon find your subdominant fish hiding at the top corners of your aquarium. If, however, the female does shudder her body, you will then see the male not chase the female away. Instead, he will stay next to her and sometimes they will nudge each other. Sometimes she will quickly swim over to her chosen cave and shudder again. I believe this is her way of trying to get the male's attention that she wants to spawn. Sometimes the male follows, sometimes he doesn't. But this behavior will be repeated numerous times over the next week. But another key sign that your fish are about to spawn is digging. As I said, I had my guys in a quarantine tank when they first spawn, and that tank was bare bottom. And obviously digging is another indicator that spawning might be on the way. But because it had the tank bare bottom, I didn't see this behavior. If you have substrate in your aquarium, and I recommend you do, the female will dig at her chosen cave site and may change sites later in preference over another site. My female has chosen three different spawning sites in the aquarium since I moved them into this one. However, the last two times have been right in the front of the aquarium, pretty much in plain sight for me to see them. 
Lelupi can lay over 200 eggs in a single spawn, with the eggs appearing a white colour, sometimes almost what appears to be a slight shade of mint green. The female will tend to the eggs, ensuring they remain clean and will circulate water onto them with a somewhat unusual swimming manner of moving her fins. After three days, the eggs will begin to hatch and the female will usually assist the fry during this time by helping them break free of the egg casing. She will then also sometimes move the wriggling fry to another location in the tank by picking them up with her mouth and spitting them out at the chosen location. The fry then take approximately five to seven days to absorb their yolk sac. It is shortly after this that the fry become free swimming. I recommend commencing target feeding of the fry around the four to five day mark after they hatch. This is to ensure they are starting to get food as some of the fry will absorb their yolk sac faster than the others. I also recommend feeding live foods at this stage to really attract the attention of the fry. Maybe brine shrimp or microworms will be perfect. Just ensure you do not constantly feed them the same food every day. I also recommend at least two feedings a day for these guys at this stage of their life. With my fry, I usually alternate the food, say brine shrimp first and then microworms later. The fry will then start taking pellets pre soaked in aquarium water from a very young age as well. Now my female Lelupi usually gets into spawning condition again about two weeks after her previous spawn has become free swimming and my guys have respawned in this time frame. The interesting thing is that this female used to defend her younger spawn from the older fry. However, her instinct to protect her younger fry from the older fry has seemed to have stopped over the last three spawns. I feel this may be because her older fry are only slightly bigger than the younger batch, so she is unable to distinguish between the two different batches of fry. As such, she does not stop the older fry from getting near the new spawn and the older fry end up eating the new spawn. I feel if she waited longer between spawns, she would be able to distinguish between the older fry and new fry and will again start protecting the new spawn, but I'm still not sure if this is the case. The issue I have with this theory is because of my second breeding pair's behavior. The female of that pair spawns as often as the female from the original pair, yet her instinct is still strong with her still defending the newest spawn from the older fry. So as much as I don't need two breeding pairs of the same species of fish in my fish room, it has been good to have them both as I am seeing very different behaviours from the same species of fish and able to report on it. The reason why I don't remove the older fry from the aquarium at the two week stage is because one, they are hard to catch and two, it would stress the parents out far too much and far too often. Basically, if the female looks after her new spawn then great, if she doesn't, so be it. Don't panic, just let nature run its course. And this brings me on to the next topic. How strong is the bond between the male and female? I would say it is moderately strong. Both females from both my breeding pairs have occasionally been attacked by the males, but this generally only lasts a day or two. The extent of this aggression usually ends up with females having a torn fin or two and occasionally hiding in the top corners of the aquarium. This can happen after removing fry from the aquarium. It is almost inevitable that you will have to remove some rocks and re it to catch all the fry. Moving pairs to different aquariums will obviously also break the bond for a longer period of time. However, I have found the bond usually reformed within approximately one week. So don't get too disheartened if you notice the bond breaking between your Leilupi pair. Just ensure your female has plenty of spaces to hide and their bond should reform within a number of days. That is what has always happened with both my breeding pairs. However, if you do need to split them up because of some serious aggression from the male, be sure to watch them closely if and when you reintroduce them to each other. The bond will definitely take longer to form if you have to end up doing this. And this advice goes for most Lake Tanganyika and substrate spawners who have semi-weak bonds. I would recommend that it is probably safer that you do not reintroduce the female to the male if they are the only two fish in the aquarium. Introducing her or him back into the aquarium while at the same time also introducing the other fish to the same tank will help spread aggression amongst all the fish and not just all on her. If you are introducing her back into his aquarium, I would also definitely do a re before introducing her into the tank. This is so the territories are reset. Taking these steps will help protect your female as much as possible. Another thing which I have noticed that is different between my two breeding pairs is the male behaviour towards their own fry. The male from my original pair has always protected his own fry. However, the male from my second pair took some time to get used to looking after his fry. It took about five to six spawns until he stopped eating his own fry. He usually did this before the little guys became free swimming. Now, I obviously could have pulled him out of the tank and let the female raise the fry herself. That obviously would have worked. But, like I said earlier, it would have been extremely difficult to reintroduce him back into the tank with his female and he possibly could have killed her. So again, just let nature run its course. The reason I did this was because I wanted him to learn how to be a good father to his fry. Some fish just take some time to get used to it and learn what they are meant to do. 
While it is extremely disheartening to see all your spawn suddenly disappear, in the long run, it is for the best. There is no other way the male would develop his parental instincts and I would be forever removing him from the tank whenever they spawn and then cautiously reintroducing him. This adds stress to him because he would forever be moved from tank to tank all the time and then again, potentially killing the female at some point. So if your male has a habit of eating his fry, as hard as it is, do your best to let nature run its course because in the long run, it will be worth it. This is what I have done with this male and as you can see, it obviously paid off because now he no longer eats his fry. Just stick with it, he will get there in the end. The fry are fairly fast growers, getting to about 2.5 centimeters, one inch, in approximately six months. They start to develop their signature yellow color from around the 1.5 centimeter mark, that's 0.5 of an inch, like you see here. The fish you see in this tank, however, are now 10 months old and some are pushing six centimeters, that's 2.5 inches. There are a mix of spawns in this tank though, hence the range of sizes you see here, and these guys will be sold off by the time you see this video. So who said cichlids from Lake Tanganyika aren't colourful? Neil Amprologus Lupi really do crush that statement. Their absolutely incredible colour rivals saltwater fish and their relatively peaceful attitude towards other cichlids make them a must for any Lake Tanganyikan community aquarium. While not exactly a fish for absolute beginners, they are more suited for a hobbyist who has had some experience keeping other Tanganyikan cichlids such as Neil Amprologus multifasciatus or Neil Amprologus brachati. I do highly recommend these guys though, especially if you come across specimens of a high quality bloodline with bright colours. After all, if you see fish of this quality with these colours, they are extremely difficult to pass up. And as you can probably tell by now, I absolutely love these guys. <laughs> so there you have it guys, the index species profile on Neal Amprologus Lupi. Really hope you enjoyed that video and found it informative. If you did, please give me a thumbs up, comment and consider subscribing to the channel. I really would appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, as you can see, Dozer's in the room with me and he's doing really well. And uh, he helped me make the video. <laughs> anyway guys, again, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks again for 4,000 subscribers. I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you in the next one. See yous.